All right. We ready to get started? Ready. How's everybody feeling today? Good. Everybody got some good energy? You know I'm a, I'm, I'm, I can pick up on energy, right? So let me ask you a question. I want to, I want to, I want I, I had something happen on the way over here that I want to see how, what your response is to this. When you have a customer complaint, when you have a customer complaint, okay, let's talk about how you handle a customer complaint. Okay, so walk, walk me through what you think is a good philosophy to handle someone is unhappy with your product or service or effort. What, what, what's, how, what's some great things to do when that happens? Okay. All right. So let's walk through this. Because sometimes it may have something to do with them, right? Maybe some kind, something's going on in their life you know nothing about. Maybe it's misdirected towards you. Maybe they didn't do their part, but they're blaming it on you, right? There's all kinds of things that could go on when you have a customer complaint, right? And so here's a couple things I want you to think about. So listen first, could be one, and I'm going to kind of walk you through a framework you can use. Because when you start doing large volume, here's one thing for you to know. When you start doing large volume, you are going to have complaints. Everybody with me? You're going to have complaints on small volume. But when you really start doing volume, there, there's virtually no way you're not going to have somebody that don't like something. Okay? I'll show you what a lot of people do when they have complaints. Okay? So listen first. What, what else can we do? Walk me through. Like if you would give me a process. Like, hey, man, I just had a customer complain about something on the way over here. Okay? All right. Take notes. Could it, could it be true that the customer actually has got some validity of something that we've not done? Yes or no? Yeah, I mean, they, they, they may be bringing to, bringing to light something that, hey, we just don't see. We didn't do very well. Okay? So, so I always said when, you know, I was a, a basketball coach, sometimes mom and dads would just light into me. It's always good to coach a game, and after a game, a mom and daddy is sitting there waiting on me, right? And I eventually stopped talking to them because it was always emotional, and they would come in there and just cuss and scream and yell because they were so emotional because it was their kids, right? And early in my career, I get very defensive. I get very, very, very defensive, and I would go right back at them, okay? Well, you're crazy. You know, you don't know what you're talking about. Your kid sucks, whatever the case, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, I never said that, okay? I, I thought it sometimes, but I never said it. But, but as I got older in my career, I may listen to it, and then I may walk away, and when I had a chance to a little decompress, I was like, you know what, they were right. I did handle that poorly. I didn't do that right. Or there was a seed of truth in what they said that was right, right? It's like, hey, I may not like the way they said it to me. I may not like the delivery they gave it to me, but what they said, they got me, right? And I just had to own it. So, so we listen, could listen first. You said take notes, right? Because there could be something in there. These are the people that are paying your salaries, by the way, which you don't ever need to forget. You know which customers I like? The ones that pay their bills. Don't you? So I, I never forget that the people that are helping me ride on that bus out there and put my kid in school and wear this clothes that I have on are our customers. Does that make sense? And no matter how mad you get at them sometimes, some, you need to remember that, right? We can't grow and expand without satisfied customers. Investors are customers, right? So we can't, no matter how much we like it, don't like it, and there's going to be high maintenance, no maintenance, low maintenance customers, right? Some people are going to be very low maintenance people. Some people are going to be very high maintenance. So we could take notes. We, we said listen first. I would change listen to agree. When a person comes at you, do not move into a defensive posture, which is your natural tendency. And the first thing is, well, you don't know what you're talking about. Let me tell you what. Well, let me tell you how long we've done this. Let me tell you how many houses we built. Let me tell you how good we are. You, you're a moron, right? For, my first step is always agree. You're right. We didn't do a very good job on that. Tell me how we could do it better. Does that make sense? Okay, so I never get into a defensive posture with a person because I'm building an adversary right there. Does that make sense? I, when I agree, I disarm them. Okay, so that's one thing you can do. What else can you do? Communication through the process. Okay, communicate through the process. So what does that mean? All the way through every step. Okay, maybe I didn't communicate with you appropriately, and you're, you, thank you for bringing that to my attention. Thank them. Now, I learned this when I worked with Demasis. Because Demas was have a thousand customers in a day, and Peter Demos was like, "We're going to have a complaint. You serve a thousand people in a day. Somebody's not going to like their steak. I don't care how good we cook it. 
don't cook it. He said, but our whole objective is to take a complaint to a promoter and how we handle the complaint. How fast do we attack that complaint? How do we, how do we, so they walk up and say, I didn't like the way my steak was cooked today. And everybody said, this is a great steakhouse or spaghetti house. You're right. You know, we cook a lot of steaks in a day. Most likely we didn't get that one right. What can we do to, what can we do to make that better? I always offer something. So this guy today was in our online academy. He's only paying 49 bucks a month. Typically the people pay the least amount of the highest maintenance, <laughs> right or wrong. He's paying a very low amount of money. I don't care. He's still a customer. So he said, you know, not get communicated well, the way I want. Well, he's in an online academy. He's not supposed to get, you know, he's really supposed to get in there and do it himself, right? But he said, I'm not getting communicated. I bought two of Coach Bird's books. You know, this is not the way you communicate with a coach. I thought he was a great coach, blah, blah, blah. So first thing I did is I pick up the phone. I call him. Hey, this is Coach Burt. Just got your complaint. Thank you for sending it to us. You're right. We haven't communicated with you appropriately, right? What can we do better? Because he wanted to cancel his service, okay? And he may say, well, it's 49 bucks. Let him go. He could be using it as an excuse because he don't have the $49. Does that make sense? He may not be using the product, but he's just looking for a way out. You follow me? So I attack it, and I agree with him first thing, which disarms him. Thank you for calling me so quick, Coach. Sure, man, you're one of our customers. What can I do to make you happy today, right? Tell you this. Tell me specifically what you want to get out of the coaching. Well, I'm an insurance guy. What if I gave you the online insurance platform with a guy who's doing $4 million a year in insurance? And that's a, that's a three ninety nine dollars value I gave to you today. Would that, would that make you happy? Man, I never thought you'd do something like that. Sure. What do I care? We're paying for the Internet. We're paying for the video guy to film them, right? What are we really giving him? Something we've already got. It's not going to cost us anything. See what I'm saying? So now he's like, feels like he's winning now. Now he's walking away going, man, I'm only paying 49 bucks and I'm getting, right? My point is, this happens all the time and how we attack something. So now, now our first stance though is to get defensive and move into a defensive posture and argue with that person about how we're right and they're wrong. I don't care because it could cost us revenue. So what's more important in your business than producing revenue or keeping revenue? Can you find anything even more important? <laughs> you know, because you want, right? In my opinion, there's nothing more important you could do in a day than creating new revenue or protecting the revenue you already got. Everybody follow me? When you're protecting investor relationships, when you're protecting uh, uh, relationships where you're building more houses or there's new opportunity there, that's the only two things you need to be focused on every day is making more revenue or protecting the revenue we got. Okay, and everything else is fluff in my opinion. Everything else is majoring into minors, okay? So is there anything else that I left out that you can do? So my stance is agree with him. That's straight out of the Bible too, by the way. Agree with your adversary, okay? Agree with him, okay? Listen to him, okay? And, and I always try to give him something. Now you may say, what can we give him? We're not going to give him a house. You know what I mean? I mean, but you, you may say, I'll give you more communication because I've dropped the ball or I'm going to give you this. But make them feel like they're winning. And if they feel like they're winning, by the time we're done, he's like, yeah, man, this is awesome. Thanks for calling me, coach. Everybody needs a coach in life. And he wanted to cancel. So I learned that at Demasis because, like I said, they have complaints. And when they have complaints, they got to respond to them, okay? And just think about when you complain about something, how people don't respond. And how do you feel about it? Everybody with me here? Okay, so that's a little, did I leave anything out? I was going to say troubleshoot the problem if you can. That's right. Because what do we typically see? The same problems over and over and over. I guarantee in the home building business, you guys are seeing the same issue come up over and over and over. For every thousand hacking at the leaves of a problem, there's one hacking at the root. What's the real problem here? Well, the real problem is we, did, we didn't do it right the first time. The real problem is we didn't quality control our work. The real problem is we, we went too fast and we didn't slow down. The real problem is our communication didn't, right? So, so these are all problems. Now, when someone gives you real hard feedback, critical feedback, again, our posture is what? Get defensive. Right? Get defensive. Anybody watch the interview I did on Good Day New York that I sent out? Anybody get a chance to see that? So I did an interview. I was on Good Day New York a week and a half ago. Biggest interview I've ever done. There's a million people watch that show. So like when you're on in Nashville, there may be a couple hundred thousand watch you on Channel 4 if that, right? Well, I was on Fox in New York City and there's, a, and there's six million people in New York City and it's a very popular morning show. So, so to give you the Tony Bennett, if you know him, he was in front of me 
and the guy on Chopped on the Food Network was behind me, or one of those Food Network shows. So it's like big, big time people. And so, you know, a lot of stress, a lot of pressure, perfect opportunity to share my message, right? And I had coaching in, in what I was supposed to say. So my coach went with me to the interview from New York City and they like, they give me this, the questions. So it's like, here, here's what they're gonna ask you. So I'm practicing, I'm practicing, I'm practicing, I'm practicing. And I get on live television from a million people and they didn't ask me one question they were supposed to ask me. Like I could see the questions on the prompter and they just completely went off script. Okay, and so I, I responded quick. If you watch the interview, I mean, it didn't throw me off because I've got a good explanation of services and I pivoted fast. And I'm thinking, man, this was good. You know, I did a great job. I was in front of a million people. This is going to be unbelievable. And I come out of that interview and my coach is sitting there like this, looking at me. And he's like, you didn't say what I coached you to say. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you're paying me all this money and there's two things I told you to say and you didn't say them. Right? He, like he was pissed at me. And I'm like, man, that was a great interview. He said, you didn't pivot like I taught you to pivot. Now, my first tendency is to do what? Beautiful. Be offensive. Hey, did you watch the interview? It's pretty good. They invited me to come back. What did I do wrong? But I was like, you know what? You're right. I'm paying you good money to tell me what I need to do, and I didn't do it. You, you see what I'm saying? Five years ago, I'd have got defensive. And I said, well, won't you get out there and do the interview then if you're that good, right? But, but now I'm more coachable. So today we're going to talk about some key things as it relates to being coachable, okay? And I first want to, I got about six topics I want to talk to you about. But one topic I want to hit first, and it really is the, is the challenge that feeds into the other topics. Typically what I see in people that are going very hard like you guys are going is there comes a point where I begin to see them fatigue. Okay, it's not in the beginning of the year because everybody starts the year fresh, right? It typically starts to show up about the sixth month of the year. We're coming into June where I start to see people get tired. And when they get tired, they get sloppy. Okay, every president that's ever made a bad decision in office all says the same thing. I made my worst decisions when I had no sleep. You know, when I was up for four, 16 straight hours and I didn't rest properly, and I made bad decisions, right? Um, so when you start to fatigue, you get sloppy, okay? And it typically happens in about the sixth year. It's like a season. Think of the NBA's 82-game season. A lot of people come out of the gate strong, and then they just kind of, right? Do you see that in your industry as well? People start to get tired. And when they start to get tired, they, they, it's like, man, this is just coming at me every day. And I'm tired, and I'm fatigued, and I just... And so when I get tired, guess what I don't do? I quit doing the things that made me great. I, quit, I get away from things because I just get tired, okay? Now, that's not what I want to talk to you about, though. I want to talk to you about the law of familiarity, okay? And what happens when we become familiar with each other, okay? What, what typically happens when people that work with each other every day become too familiar with each other? Hold each other accountable. Okay. They do what now? They can't hold each other accountable, okay, because why? Emotional conflict. That's right. Personal okay. I had a guy that worked on my team for a number of years, liked him, he's like a son to me. And the biggest mistake I made is I began to not hold him accountable because I liked him. And he's over at my house. You know what I mean? We kind of raised him. His dad wasn't in the equation. And his sales numbers began to slip. And I never held him accountable, right? And the less I held him accountable, the worse his performance got. Does that make sense? And when I tried to hold him accountable, it, it never was consistent enough. And it became, and, and we got a business to run. So we're not hitting our sales numbers. He's really in charge of sales. I'm not holding him accountable. He's like a son to me. So I, when I get on him, he kind of don't listen like your kids. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, like, like I watch my daughter who will run around and swing off that thing right there, and I take her to Montessori school, and, I, and she, we pull up to that school, you know what she says? Hello, good morning, nice to see you this morning. That's how she talks to her teacher. I'm like, who, who is this in the back? It ain't my kid, because my kid was running around in the back, screaming and yelling, you know what I'm saying? And that teacher, you know, Mrs. Weaver, I mean, she's like, bam, I don't play around. So she's like proper, prim, smiles, shakes her hand. I'm like, what, what, what's happening here? 
Well, that woman can hold her accountable. She sees daddy all the time. Does that make sense? She sees me and she gets so comfortable with me, I can't say no to her every second of the day. So she gets real loose, she gets real relaxed. Does that make sense? And my wife's like, you, you gotta get more structure. You have gotta be more accountable because that little girl will run all over you if you let her, okay? Well, that was my mistake in a lot of ways when I, when I wouldn't hold him accountable because we got too comfortable with each other. So what happens when we get familiar with each other and you guys work very closely with each other is we get, we start A, taking each other for granted Sometimes we start taking advantage of each other, right? Like if you pick up my mess, I'll start to rely on you to pick up my mess. You see what I'm saying? Because you always come in and, and, and get bail me out. And B, we just, we kind of give crumbs to each other. And what I mean by that is we're so familiar with each other that it's, it becomes too comfortable. And when it becomes too comfortable, I don't really give you my best effort. Because you're not going to say anything to me and we're real close and... And, and we just get too comfortable with each other, okay? And it all happens because why? Because we become familiar with each other, okay? If you're married like I am, hey, when I get home, man, I wear clothes that don't match, <laughs> look awful, don't shave. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I look like a totally different person. And my wife, you know, we, we just get comfortable with each other. We, and what happens is we don't kind of give each other our best anymore because we're too comfortable with each other. You, you see what I'm saying? And my wife will tell me sometimes, look, I know you wear suits all the, all the time and you want to wear something comfortable, but I sit at home all day with our four-year-old and I want to get dressed up and I want to go out to dinner. And she's like, what, what are you going to wear out tonight? I'm like, warm-up suit. <laughs> she's like, no, we're not going out to dinner when you're wearing a warm-up suit. Put on some nice clothes. So, so you see what I'm saying there? I get comfortable. It's up to me, I wear something comfortable. She's like, you know, get dressed up and look, look good. You look good for everybody else. Look good for me, right? And she's right. So, so when you see this, how does this begin to affect you guys? Because one of my main concerns about coaching you, I just left the Wilson Group this morning, who I was coaching, Christy Wilson Group Real Estate. And before that, I was with uh, the Sims team. So I coached two big real estate teams this morning. And uh, one of my major concerns has been with you since working with you every month has been what? What, what is it? You know? You don't seem to know right now. Let me come back. Let me call somebody else. Accountability. Yeah. One of my biggest concerns is, is how close you are and how familiar you get with each other and how comfortable you get with each other. Does that make sense? And, and, and I'm, I'm concerned about that because as a former coach, I saw what happened when we begin to get too loose with each other. You, you follow me? Some people can handle that and some people can't. Some people can handle a, a lack of structure and, and loose accountability because they're very professional. They take a lot of pride in their work. They don't need anybody else to hold them accountable. They, they don't need a process. They, they create their own processes and structures. And some people, their personality styles and stuff can just not handle. Does that make sense? So I always erred as a coach, and I'm guilty of this with my own company. I'll be honest with you. Listen, I, I struggle with this too. I hire people that are relatively expensive people now and I expect them to show up and do their job every day. You follow me? I don't like micromanaging people. I do not like coming behind a person to hold them accountable. But I find when I don't when I don't do that sometimes and they don't respond to me, it becomes like a bunch of suggestions. It's like loose suggestions. It's like, hey, have you called that customer back? No, I hadn't called him back. Have you done this? No, you know. And I'm like, D do I need to tell you in a stronger way and they'll be like coach don't micromanage me and I'm like I'm not micromanaging you but this is not getting done does that make sense mm -hmm. what 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 I'm what I'm asking you to do like like lightly asking you is not getting done and because it's not getting done we could lose customers we could lose money and if we lose enough money guess what I don't need you <laughs> I love you but I can't have all of this. Like my team is constantly on me about hiring more people. And I'm like, you hit our revenue numbers every month and you show me we can hit our sales goals every month and I'll hire more people. But it cannot be one month we hit them and one month we don't. Does, it, does that make sense? You know, and, and, and sometimes my team will ask me, what about a bonus coach? Can I get a bonus? And I'm like, there is no bonus until we hit our goals every month. Does that make sense? Until we hit our numbers that we, that, that that you told me you could hit when I hired you, <laughs> which is the reason I hired you, 
We don't even talk about extra money. You, you go do what we hired you to do first. That, this is your core responsibility. Then we'll talk about bonuses. And so I guess what I'm saying is I'm guilty of this sometimes in my own company as I let people get a little too loose because I'm out in the world trying to make it rain and then we get too loose with each other. So how does that affect us? How does it affect you personally here at this team? Because it affects everybody. It creates a stressful situation. Okay, it creates a stressful situation. And, and, and what happens is something that's not a big deal eventually becomes a big deal. Investors. Yeah. What happens is, I, I used to tell my managers as a basketball coach, y'all appreciate this, I had these little 15-year-old managers, and I'd say, if you forget the extension cord to this game, we can't film the game. And if we can't film the game because you forgot the extension cord, I can't watch the film the next time we play them. What happens if I, don't, I can't watch the film, therefore I can't prepare like I need to, and we lose the next game when we're playing them because you forgot the extension cord? You see how big a deal that is? Because back in those days, they didn't have cameras. That you, you know what I'm saying? You had to, you had to literally plug them in to the, extent, to the thing, right? And you know why? Because one night we had a manager forget the extension cord. So we get to the game. Thank goodness we're playing an awful team. But what if we're playing a great team and, and preparation was watching game film? I had to watch hours of game film. So it creates little things not to, remember this, little things not taken care of on the front end always turn out to be big things on the back end, right or wrong. Absolutely. And I know, what's his name? Richard Carlson wrote Don't Sweat the Small Stuff and he showed millions of books and I picked that book up and read it and threw it out the window. You know what I said? P big time people sweat the small things. You know, I get don't be stressed about little bitty things sometimes in life because in the grand scheme it's not that important. But what I have found is that, is that big producers Pay attention to details. It's very critical that we get some of these things right. So one is it could create a stressful situation, right? And a stressful situation could be we don't deliver on what we said we was going to deliver and the time we said we was going to do it, so we lose, we take a big hit somewhere, either in consumer confidence, right? And that's really what you're selling to investors, by the way, is confidence in money. Y'all know that, right? And if you're, cons if, if, if consumer confidence is we've just lost you know, look at what happened to United. They lost a billion dollars in a day when, when that person got drug off that airplane. A billion. Now, and, I, and I'm not even saying, like I said, I, I, I'm not even assigning blame there because it could have been a lot of people's fault. Could have been a police officer that drug the person off. Could have been, but, but the perception was what? It was the airline. Yeah. They just fired the CEO of Ford, if you noticed that in the last couple of days. Profits were up but there were downward trends that they were not keeping up, perception was low, stockholders were unhappy, and so they walk in after three years and fire this guy because the perception is you're not getting us there. That's just consumer confidence. Everybody follow me here? So what could happen when we don't follow through and, and is, is that could be, you know, we create a lot of stress for ourselves here when we don't follow through, okay? What else, Benjamin? What else happens? What else when we, when we lose that accountability between each other? Let me ask. I feel like there's no consequence if, if okay, there you go. Now, here, here's a thought I want you to remember. Okay, just put this in your head. And this is in any factor of life with kids or adults where there's no consequences, there is no change of behavior. Where there's no consequence, there's no change of behavior. And I've used the example of me and Tootsie's. You know, back in my single days, I like to come down to Broadway have a few cocktails, have fun. And during the dating phase of me and my wife, uh, that happened one night and I got home at seven o'clock the next morning. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Had to do with my bus, ended up in Hendersonville. <laughs> it's a long story. <laughs> Different people on there, you know. So my, my, you know, fiance, what do you think she said? Don't look like you can handle that anymore. You know what I'm saying? Because I couldn't find you. You didn't answer your phone. I didn't know where he's at. I'm seeing pictures of all these people on your bus. Who are these people? I'm like, people that read my books, baby. What, I mean, what can I say, you know? <laughs> Person of interest. And that didn't play very well, right? And uh, my wife said, you, you, you must not be mature enough to go to Nashville and enjoy country music without me. 
So if we're going to be married, ain't no more of that, right? What could I say? Okay. You're right. <laughs> I mean, what could I say? I didn't have an argument. I went out, I come home at 7 o'clock in the morning with strangers on my bus. <laughs> so you know what? She said it's not good for you and I to go to those places separately. You know what I'm saying? Because you can't handle it. There's a consequence to that. The consequence is you can't do it if you're going to be married to me, right? Well, what I find is that if there's no consequence in the workplace and I just keep letting you, under, I keep letting you slip on this, is that we eventually end up with no standard. And if we end up with no standard, everything suffers. You follow me here? And, and are, we proud of, are we selling a standard, yes or no? Yes. See, y'all are selling me on quality. Uh, you're selling me on creativeness. You're selling me on a different product. You're selling me that, that you got better designers. You're selling me that you got better everything. Well, when that standard begins to slip, we're just a commodity. We're just building an old standard house that anybody could build. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and, and see, that's just so common. And I don't think you got into this business to be common. You follow me here? So, so why do we stop, why do we stop, um, let me rephrase this. When do we start giving crumbs to each other to where it's not important that I give you my best? When does that start? When we become too familiar with each other, right? There's no special anymore. There's no special between us. It's like I'm so familiar with you there's nothing, there's nothing for us to protect anymore. You know, when you work in the president's office, I always love watching West Wing, and one of the things they always do is they say they serve at the pleasure of the president, you know what I'm saying? And there's a respect for the office of presidency. Like when you walk in there, when you're in meetings, it's like an honor. I stayed at a house in Malibu this week. If you ever go to Malibu, you ever been to Malibu, California? It sets up this 21-mile stretch of California that's beautiful. And I, I stayed up at a house of the hills where I'm way, way, way up. And like we have mountains in Tennessee, but you go way up there and there's mountains and ocean. It was gorgeous. And I stayed at a person that was a former speechwriter at the White House. So her house was really cool and she had all these pictures of her and President Bush and her. And she was so, like it was like a really big deal. You know what I'm saying? Like I worked at the White House. I, I served at the highest level. And there's a certain amount of respect. And whether you like it or not, you, you follow protocol. You follow protocol. And the reason, if you don't follow protocol, whether you like what the president says or not, you serve at the pleasure of what the president says. These people that don't follow what Trump says, he's a pretty simple guy, right? You either do what I tell you to do or you're fired. I mean, that's literally how he operates, which could create a lot of chaos. But when we start becoming familiar with each other, so have you seen that happen here since we got into the last couple of months? Have you seen, have you feel some of that happening? Yes or no? All progress starts by telling the truth. Right? So do you think it's because of lack of accountability or do you think a lack of consequence or what do you think it's because? Both. Both. Now on the other end of that spectrum, what consequences could there be? Like, like if I tell my director of client engagement I want my churn rate under 2% and she comes in at 3 and I say, look, you've been hired to keep it under 2%, right? You're being incentivized to keep it under 2%, and it's been three the last two months. That means three out of every 100 customers are canceling on us. You follow me? Now, she could come back to me and say, Coach, the national rate is 4 to 6%. <laughs> she could justify it, because the national rate is 4 to 6%, right? She could say, I'm still above the national average, and I could say, you said the magic words, average. Do you want to be average? Did I hire you for 4% or did I hire you for 2%? Does that make sense here? So what you could say when I say something to you on accountability is, well, hey, we're building them as fast as we can, as good as we can. What more do you want from me? My lungs? <laughs> My firstborn child, right? Or you could say what? You're right. I have gotten a little loose. I take full responsibility for that. Now, which one do you think earns more respect? Yeah, what if she said to me, you're right, coach. I am, I, I am the best customer engagement person in the world, and I will, I will do everything I can for you to get that churn under 2%. What if I said, if you don't get it under 2% in the next three months, I'm going to fire you? 
right? What if I had to have five conversations with her about it? What if I mentioned it every week at the meetings and nothing changed? And so at some point, am I making a suggestion to you? Does that make sense? Or is this like a directive? <laughs> and I work with First Bank, which is a $5 billion mortgage company, and I would sit in on the executive meetings with the main guy, and I would hear him say this, we need to do this, we need to do this, we need to do this. And then, nothing would happen. Like three months later, I'd say, you know, how's it going? You know what I'd say? We didn't do any of that stuff. And I would, and I asked him directly, do, do they not have a fear of a consequence with you? Or, or is it a suggestion to you? Are you suggesting to them? Or why, why are they not responding to that? Is there no consequence to them? Like, like why is this like, a, so he would tell me we have a lack of execution. And I would say, why do we have a lack of execution? Why don't they take that concept and go do it? You, you understand what I'm saying? Why don't they do what you're asking them to do? You're the boss. You're the leader. So, so I would say maybe they've gotten too comfortable with you. Maybe y'all are too familiar. Maybe there's no consequence. Maybe they don't understand the ramifications of it. See what I'm saying? But either way, he was constantly pissed because they weren't doing it. And they would always justify why they didn't do it. Well, we didn't know he was serious about that. I mean, he talks about it all the time, but we didn't know he's serious. So I, I got to get you guys thinking that we don't want to slip like that. There's got to be a level of special that we protect between each other. <clears throat> and because there's this business of running the business, which is what do we have to protect here? What are we trying to protect? Reputation. There you go. Bottom line, the money. Yeah. Is it important that you would protect your reputation between each other? Of course. You see what I'm saying? Like I think that's the first thing that goes between buddies is, you know, you kind of lose... You've seen your buddy do everything, so it's like, you know, you don't take them that serious. But, you, but in a workplace, you've got to be able to protect that reputation, not only internally, but externally. And you want a reputation of, hey, you give it to me, I follow through, man. It's like money in the bank when you give it to me. There is no questions asked. When I, so so I, want, I want you guys to really think about this lack of accountability. And I want you to think about the consequence. Like, like in my opinion, give me some of the uh, excuses that you use when, when there's that slippage right there and you're kind of giving crumbs to each other. And giving crumbs to each other is, you know, you asked me to do it, but I didn't do it. And I don't have a good excuse why I didn't do it. I just kind of give you a little half-hearted effort. That's crumbs, right? What are some of the excuses people use here, specifically? Subs didn't show up. Say again? Sub subs didn't show up. Yep, okay. Weather. Weather. Yeah, time. Are they are they valid or are they excuses? I mean, at the end of the day, some could be valid, some could be excuses, right or wrong. Excuse is just a self-proclaimed opt-out clause. Okay? Like here's one I hear a lot, too busy or I'm overwhelmed. I'm too busy or I'm overwhelmed. And I was thinking about this morning, if I don't get to spend time with my daughter in the morning, because I'm too busy and I got to be at work at six or seven o'clock, could I not get up at five o'clock? Right or wrong? Could I get up an hour earlier, spend some time by, to myself and spend some time with my daughter and pick up an hour, right? So I'm not too busy to spend time with her. I just want to sleep a little bit later, <laughs> right? I could cut something out in the day and get home 30 or 45 minutes earlier if I was more effective in my day so I'd have time to her at night. So that's kind of an excuse to say I don't have any time with her when I really could find time. Okay, so that's, that's not, I'm not really too busy. So this concept of overwhelm, if you, if you catch yourself using this word overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed, in my opinion, you can build more capacity to handle more. And what I mean by that is mindset, preparation, attack of a day, mapping out what you're doing. You can actually build capacity so you're not overwhelmed, right? Overwhelmed is kind of a word a lot of people use that are, that are I won't say weak-minded, but, but it's a very easy place to go. I'm so overwhelmed. I'm so overwhelmed. I'm so, why are you overwhelmed? Because you're busy? Why are you busy? Are you planning your days out? Are you mapping your days out? Are you efficient with your time? Do you practice high value activity? Do you participate in minor discussions during the day that cost you time? So when you start thinking about these things, sometimes they really are excuses, right? They really are excuses, okay? What else? I'm not saying everything's an excuse. Sometimes, sometimes things happen, right? You know, when I work with Old South, when they had bad weather days, 
it was a complete waste of a day. I mean, for all the like superintendents, I was like, what are y'all doing? Could we not be on the phone calling customers? Could we not be mapping out plans? Could we not be doing this? It was like just a day off. And I'm like, man, this is ridiculous. I'm gonna take a day off just because it rains. Let's find some high value activity to participate in on bad weather days. You, you see what I'm saying? This time, this is valuable time here. And they didn't think like that. You know? Okay, so what else? Excuses is one. When we get when we get too comfortable with each other, it's slippage. And the slippage is we just kind of let her, we let it let it go a little too much. Respect. Respect. And what's that worth? I mean, what is, it, what is that worth, really? How valuable is that? How valuable is reputation to each other? How valuable is follow-through to each other? How valuable is, 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 is all of this stuff to each other? So I want to walk away from today with you really thinking about we need to close those gaps on this accountability loop, okay? And, and because here's what I know as a leader, and I just put myself, uh, I'm my owner of a company. And there is a business to run in this business. Does that make sense? We have to be profitable. And you know why we have to be profitable? Because we cannot grow and expand without profitability. Everybody follow me here? So I have to watch the bottom line of what we're doing. I have to be profitable because I can't expand. And I'll just be honest with you. I'm not going to work as hard as I work for me not to make any money. <laughs> I'm not going to work this hard to make a, just this much money. Does that make sense? I mean, I got into this to, to make money and help people. So there's a business to run in the business that most employees don't understand. And it is the, the business of generating ca uh, capital and cash minus the expenses and where we could pick up. Like yesterday, I was in Knoxville, Tennessee. We ordered a bunch of Subway sandwiches people didn't eat. And I'm sitting there going, man, we wasted $20, but $20 $25 because we, we, we got food that nobody ate. Right? That money didn't come out of their pocket. It came out of my pocket. It came out of the company pocket. So why did we do that? Well, employee just goes in there and says, hey, give us 10 subs. We got four people with us, but get 10 subs. You see what I'm saying? I'm like, who's, I mean, who's going to eat two or three subs? You follow me? I'm like, that's $20 wasted right there. I see that. I see everything as, hey, this is a liability. This costs us money. This costs us money. This costs us money. And there's a business to run in this business that's very tough, right? And so my ability to go sell something is directly predicated by my team's ability to deliver on what we sold. But what if I lose confidence in my team? You lose confidence in yourself. So what I start doing is subconsciously I'm hesitant to go sell because I don't know if we can deliver this or not because we let people down. And, and so I could put pressure on my team, right? But th what if they're not responding? And we've had this talk 17 times. And then I'm like, man, what do I do with you? So what I tell my team is I hate being backed into a corner. One of the things I really hate is don't back me into a corner because if you back me into a corner, I will make a decision. You follow me? And that decision may mean that you're gonna go. There's gonna be two of us left here. And, and my name's on the front of the building and yours ain't. <laughs> so if somebody's going, it ain't me. Does that make sense? So, so I say, you know what I tell my employees? Just don't put me in that position. Don't put me in a position where I gotta be difficult. Don't put me in a position where I gotta come down on you. Don't put me in a position where I gotta hold your hand. Don't put me in a position where I gotta ask you 10 times. Because if I have to do that, I will get rid of you. You, you see what I'm saying here? Now, why would we have to get to that point? Okay, could be, it could be, I may not be giving them a clear definition. And, I, and you know what I think? I think you, you would need to tell me that. What do you want specifically from me? And I, and I can be guilty of that. Sometimes I'm a generalist. Sometimes I think you ought to just pack your bags and come to work and figure it out, right? But sometimes my employees are like, look, I don't know, what do you want from me specifically? So I could do a better job of that. Hey, here's direct expectations. So let me tell you how I measure it. I measure revenue and churn and numbers because the numbers don't lie. What I'm trying to do is take the subjective feeling out of it. You feel what I'm saying? If it's subjective, I like you, uh, but we're not hitting our, our sales number and our churn rate's too high. 
and you're in charge of sales and you're in charge of churn. You with me here? So although I like you, something's not working. How, what can we do? Like if I say we got to build these houses, we got to build these houses in this time period on this cost margin. That makes sense? And the last six houses are not on this time measure and they're not on this cost margin. What, do you, what would you like for me to do? <laughs> you want me to change it? Or you want me to back off of you? Or do you, you see what I'm saying here? And so what I don't want to do as an owner of a company is just be put in that position where I've constantly got a hammer on a person and say, come on, man. We hired you because we thought what? You are the best. We went through a lot of duds that we would never hire. And we got you. And there's a reason we got you because we believe you're the best. You know, one of those uh, articles in the USA Today not long ago was talking about how the University of Auburn hired Bruce Pearl, you know, who was a coach at Tennessee there. And one of the, one of the things they were saying was Auburn have, have not got their money out of him. <laughs> so he asked for, you know, 2.1 million. They paid him 2.1, and they've been in the bottom of the SEC the last three years he's been the coach. So the article was making this case that they put money into something, and they're not getting their money back. And so they were saying he needs to go because sports is just business, right? It's just, it's just based on performance. And, and what they'll do is if he don't perform, they will fire him, right? So, so I want you guys to always just remember, just remember it this way, not in a negative light. Remember it in a positive light. Protect that special between each other. Y'all really have something special here. You know, you really do. You got some cool things doing, and I don't know if you, any of you will be involved in my new greatness factory. Any of these people be involved in this? If, wait, when you see this new greatness factory we're building, I just got the final plans the other day. It's, it's unbelievable, man. I mean, it is a special, special place that will help a lot of people. And guess what? I can't do it without you. I can dream it up, but I can't build it. Does that make sense? And I need you to be good, because we're building a, you, we, you can't be good and build a greatness factory. <laughs> I can't go through this process and go, man, they're just, dang, they're average. <laughs> Who'd y'all use? Average group to build the greatness factory. Ain't that an oxymoron? But, but here's the real point of this, guys, and I'll, I'll close on this. If I'm gonna trust you to build something, out of all the people I could use, okay, I gotta know that you're world class. Does that make sense? Because when I use you, guess what? I'm gonna piss off all the other builders I work with. <laughs> Don't think I'm not. They're gonna say, well, why didn't you use us? I already had people. All, some of my builders that I coached said, well, why wouldn't you use us? Why would you use a company out of Nashville? You live in Murfreesboro, the greatest factory in Murfreesboro? And I said, I value their work. I think they're gonna bring the kind of creativeness I need. I want to bring some of Nashville to Murfreesboro. And I, don't, and I didn't say it like this, like I don't think you can do that. <laughs> but I'm thinking, I, I think they have something special and I, I don't know that you have something as special. You follow me here? Well, you can't deliver on that promise to me unless y'all are very tight on this accountability thing, okay? And don't think I can't be a high maintenance customer. So I will be watching to see how you do this. Does that make sense? And you know what I want to do? I want to build this thing. And you know what I want to say next? When we bring one to Nashville. And when we're taking one to Cool Springs. And what if I want to go down to Huntsville and build one? And I was on the phone today with I was on the phone today with somebody who wanted listen, as soon as I put it out, people want to franchise these things. I was on the phone today with a guy in Baltimore, Maryland. He said, You I will build one right now in Maryland, today, if you'll if you'll put the franchise agreement together. Okay, I got a guy in Dallas, Texas that wants to build one. So there's no telling once we build one of these things and it's right the first one, what what could happen? I mean, we could see one in every city, everywhere. That's my ultimate goal. So what's the lesson from today? Give me a takeaway. Give me a takeaway. Hold each other accountable. Hold each other accountable. Don't you think big time people want accountability, yes or no? Yes, sir. Don't be afraid of it. Yes, sir. Don't be afraid of accountability. Why did Jordan go to a coach after the games? Because he had two scorecards. One for him and one for the way they were measuring, right? Hold each other accountable. And here's what I would say. Take each other serious. Take each other serious. If y'all ask each other to do something, treat, if, like if me and you work together, and I always call him Benjamin because I like him. <laughs> but if, if Benjamin and I work, work together, okay? Yeah, everybody likes Benjamin. Come on. Why does everybody like Benjamin? <laughs> but, but my point is, yeah, I know it makes you a little nervous. <laughs> but, but, but here's my point. If he and I are working together, don't, don't use all your good stuff just for the consumer and give him leftovers. 
He don't need to tell the consumer every, that he'll follow through for them and not follow through for me. You see what I'm saying? That's what happens when we become too familiar with each other is I give my best stuff to somebody else other than you. That's really what crumbs is. What if I give you all my best stuff and I go home tonight and give my wife crumbs? That ain't fair to her. What, why don't I give both of you my best? Why can't I give my daughter my best? So that's what happens in the workplace when y'all get too comfortable with each other, is I kind of give my best out there, but back here I give you seconds. I give you leftovers, and that ain't fair to each other. You can't build something special like that, okay? Don't be afraid to conflict. Listen, Bezos, you ought to sit in on a Bezos meeting at Amazon where how he challenges people. I mean, he will flat out challenge people hard, and they have to have themselves together, and they have to, he makes them write up six-page summaries on their ideas. So they come to a meeting and they want to do something to the company, they have to have it six pages, documented, share it with the group. And, you know, he, he is so critical because he, he, Amazon is going to be one of the most profitable companies in the world. I mean, I want to say profitable, the biggest revenue generating companies in the world. And he's like, man, I ain't in this to be average. I'm in it to freaking dominate the world, okay? So he expects and demands that out of his people. And if you study, some people don't like that. So there's a lot of, you know, question about could you work at Amazon under him or not? Because he's so rigid and tough on his people. But what do they produce? Amazing, amazing things on how they do that, okay? So good lesson today, guys.